Welcome to a very special day in chapel today as we reflect on Veterans Day. I'd like us to stand and sing together, God of grace and God of glory. There is power, power, wonder 
invite you to go ahead and be seated where you are. As you're being seated, let me say, first of all, happy birthday to those Marines who are here today. Today is the 229th birthday of the United States Marine Corps, November 10th, 1776, Tons Tavern. Hope you enjoy celebrating your birthday today. Also would uh, like to uh, offer an affirmation to those who have joined us for our Veterans Day recognition. We realize that Veterans Day is tomorrow, but we thought it might be appropriate to get a head start today. Many of uh, those who are uh, in our service will be involved in other activities tomorrow, so we thought it would be a good opportunity today on this chapel today uh, to rec- make those recognitions. Scratched on the wall at the prisoners of war camp in Vietnam, referred to as the Hanoi Hilton, is this statement. Freedom has a taste to those who fight and almost die that the protected will never know. As we accent freedom in our worship today, part of such of an emphasis should include recognizing those who have helped secure our freedom. We should remember their sacrifice, thank them for their service, and seek to support them as best we can. In recognizing such sacrifice in 1954 in his presidential speech on Veterans Day, President Eisenhower affirmed the sacrifices of our veterans with these words. We solemnly remember the sacrifices of those who fought so valiantly on the seas, in the air, and on foreign shores to preserve our heritage of freedom and to let us reconsecrate ourselves to the task of promoting an enduring freedom and peace that their efforts shall not have been in vain. Next, allow me to read a thank you letter from the current Chairman Joint Chiefs of Staff, Air Force General Richard Myers, as a thank you to our current past and future veterans. He says this, On Veterans Day, we pause to honor and thank our veterans, past and present, those who have served and those who are serving today around the world, advancing freedom and the cause of liberty. Since the Colonial Minutemen first stood soldier to soldier, Countless Americans have answered our nation's call to serve and defend liberty. They are true heroes. In the past century alone, they fixed bayonets at the Battle of Marne. They stormed the beaches of Normandy and Omaha, assaulted Heartbreak Ridge, patrolled the Laudrang Valley, and stared down our adversaries on the plains of Europe. They stood as shining examples of ordinary to defend a grateful nation. Like those who wore the uniform before them, today's Armed Forces members continue that proud legacy. At this very moment, this very moment, American servicemen and women, both active and reserved, from every walk of life, from every ethnic, religious, and racial background, serve in harm's way. From the mountains in Afghanistan to the sands of Iraq, from the jungles of Colombia to the shores of of the Philippines. They're giving hope to millions that liberty, justice, and lasting peace are within reach. Today, the proud men and women of our armed forces are once again engaged in a global struggle against those who threaten our way of life. At every turn, they demonstrate our firm resolve and serve notice to terrorists that we will succeed. We are proud of their commitment, dedication, and accomplishment. The Joint Chiefs of Staff and I thank our veterans for their selfless service and for ensuring that continued security of our nation will endure. May God bless you and God bless America. Today, the support that we can offer might be best demonstrated in our prayers. I would like to lead us now in a focused time of prayer for our veterans and their families. To assist us in this prayer focus, I'm going to ask four people to join me at the platform. Isaac Gilliard, retired Sergeant Major from the United States Marine Corps who served in Vietnam. He'll be praying for our past veterans. Isaac, if you would come. Daniel Jafreda, U.S. Navy Seaman, Religious Program Specialist, 
home from Iraq for approximately one year after serving with the Marines in Operation Iraqi Freedom. Daniel will pray for current military personnel, particularly those in harm's way. Samantha Sullivan, hopeful in becoming a chaplain candidate, she will be praying for military personnel training in boot camp with anticipated service and future deployment. And Dr. Jim Shaddix, Dean of our chapel, whose son is in the Navy. He will be leading us to pray for the members of our military personnel and their families. And then I will lead us in a closing emphasis on praying for our leaders as they chart the course toward a horizon arrayed with all the splendor of God's peace. I will provide prayer prompts for each of these. And after they have prayed a brief prayer, a verse of a hymn, The Eternal Father, will be sung by our soloist. Use the time while the verse is being sung to pray in silence for the identified group. And I would ask that those present who belong to these identified groups, please stand where you are. We pray for the for those still live on this earth, sometimes void of common mind, common sense, and the things that war has robbed us of, we ask you to continue to enlighten our lives as you guide our path and our, order our steps upon life. Guard over the families that reside without the father, uncles, and relatives that died in war of days past. We ask you to continue to bless this great nation from whom all blessings flow. Eternal Father, strong to save, whose arm hath bound the restless wave, who bids the mighty ocean deep its own appointed. for current military personnel, particularly those in harm's way. Father God, we just come before your throne right now, Father God, realizing that we're here, Father, for a reason. And Father, the freedom that we have does not come free. And there's people at this very moment, Lord, that are giving their lives to that freedom. Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit will just be with them, Father God. You will comfort them, give them the courage, Father God, and endurance to carry out their task, God, diligently and with great care, Father. I pray for your people that you have placed over there in their midst, that, Father, your gospel may be known to them, that, Father, God, even if they lose their life here, they will gain it in eternity. Father, we just pray for them. We pray for a calmness over their heart. Father, God, our focus in the midst of the chaos of the battle. Father, most of all, that you be glorified and that they see your hand at work. In the name of Christ Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Eternal Father, Lord of hosts, watch o'er the men who guard our coast, protect them from the raging sea, and give them light and life and peace. Grant for our military personnel training in this camp with anticipated service and future deployment. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much, God, that we've got men and women that are willing to serve. God, men and women that are willing to, to give their lives, God, for this country. God, as they serve, I pray that they'll come to know you if they don't. And God, as they're out there, 
I pray that they'll be able to see your hope. And God, as they're training, knowing that in the future they will be deploying. God, just give them strength. Help them to learn what they need to learn, God, and, and protect them. Lord God, just thank you for their willingness to serve. God, just as they're in boot camp right now, working hard, God, I pray that they'll work hard for you as well. God, bring people in their lives that they'll be able to know you. And God, just help them as they're overseas, as they're training to go over there. God, just protect them. In Jesus' name, amen. Eternal Father, grant we pray to all Marines, both night and day, the courage, honor, strength, and skill their land to serve my for family members of our military personnel and veterans. Father, we appeal to you as the God of grace and the God of glory today. Father, you have said that you are able to make all grace abound toward us, that always with all sufficiency in all things we have an abundance for every good work. Lord, the military men and women who are part of the families represented here today, some standing, and they represent many others, Lord, are, are about a good work. And so, God, we ask you, we ask you that all grace would abound toward them today, that always with all sufficiency in this good thing, that they would have an abundance, God, a special measure. Lord, you have said in your word that you would be a father to the fatherless and that you would be a husband to the widow. And God, there, there are some who have, have lost husbands, who've lost wives, who've lost children. And, and God, I want to pray that you would be true to your word to them today. Would you do that, God? Lord, there are many others that that the father is simply absent because of service. The, the, the mother is, is absent because of an assignment. Children are serving, Lord, on, on the field, and there are parents who, who are lonely. God, would you be that to them today? I pray that you would embrace each one with a, a special sense of your loving arms of comfort and encouragement, of staying power. You be for them, Lord, a strong tower, a very present help in time of trouble, someone that they can run to. God, come to the aid of your children today who have loved ones who are serving abroad. In Jesus' name, amen. God, who still the restless foam protect the ones we love at home provide that they should always be by thine own grace both safe and free Oh, Father, hear 
join me in praying for the leaders of our nation. God, I pray today that you would give incredible discernment to our president, to members of the Congress, to the Senate and the House, to understand the needs of our nation and the world as they relate to freedom. Father, help them to be fearless and understanding and being willing to pay the price for freedom. But at the same time, Lord, help them to never make the mistake of paying one penny more or one life more for this precious value and gift that we cherish so much in this great nation. Help us to remember to pray for them, not only on this day, but every day, as they chart the course of the lives of our veterans and those who seek to serve us well in this capacity. We do want to welcome you today to this very, very special service. Thank you for coming and joining together as a community of faith in worship as well as celebration, reflection, and remembrance and prayer. We do want to welcome those of you that are joining us by way of the Internet as well. We appreciate you very much coming and being a part of this time. We have already been led in worship by Dr. Indel Lee as he's guided us through that prayer time. He will continue to be one of our worship leaders today as he preaches for us in just a little bit. You know him as he serves as professor of preaching and pastoral ministries at Level College here on our faculty. And he mentioned to you that we have chosen to uh, uh, set this day aside uh, to observe uh, these that have served and are serving in our armed forces as opposed to tomorrow for two reasons, one of which he mentioned to you that these that are participating uh, will have other assignments tomorrow, but also we were able to schedule him to preach today, and we felt like as one of our military personnel, uh, this would be a wonderful day uh, for us to do that. His wife, Kathy, uh, is here. She also serves here on our staff 
at uh, the seminary and coordinating special events. They're two boys, uh, Cody and Hunter. We're delighted that you, you are here today. And uh, Dr. Lee, we look forward uh, as you lo- lead us in worship. The next two songs are not familiar to you. Uh, you know the tune to this one. But I found this set of words in a, a, one of those non-Baptist hymn books that uh, talked about freedom and had some wonderful words. And so I've chosen that. And the song we'll do immediately following that is brand new to all of it, all of us because I just wrote it yesterday. And it's a, a little bit of a, um, probably you think of it more as a children's tune, but uh, it just talks about the freedom that we have in Christ and I hope we'll enjoy doing those things together. accentuating that great refrain from Scripture, free indeed. I hope you know that today. We're going to focus on that a little while as you turn in your Bibles with me to John chapter 8. John chapter 8 is where I want us to give our attention today. Freedom seems to be one of the basic desires of life. I've learned this well in the last year from my pet, Major. Maybe some of you know this saga. Maybe some of you have actually participated in it. When we moved into our home about a year ago, a fence was put up to define Major's boundaries. But they left a gap at the bottom of the fence, and he was able to stick his nose underneath that gap and get just a whiff of freedom. And with that, he began to dig. And it wasn't too long, just a matter of minutes, and Major was out of the yard, and roaming the campus. 
Well, we did what we could to try to make provisions for him, to help him realize his boundaries. We put him on a chain, or actually it was a cable. He ran and around and around and around and twisted the cable so much that eventually he broke free from that and again got the whiff of freedom and he was gone again. This had manifested itself so well that neighbors have brought Major home. They know where he lives, so they just get him and bring him back to the house. The security guards know Major on a first-name basis, and they call him. And he comes to them, and he just gets in the back of the truck, and they bring him back to the house, no matter what time of day or night at sea. We continue to meet these challenges and progressions. We put chicken wire down against the fence and underneath the sod to trap him, and that worked for a little while. But they came back to work on another portion of the fence, and again, you saw just a little bit of daylight. Got a whip of freedom and actually dug through the chicken wire. It had rusted some because he wanted freedom so bad. Well, we took it to a whole new level this past Saturday, and we put an electric fence around the yard there. We were trying not to do that, but it, it came to that sort uh, just to help Major realize the limits of his freedom. But I have been astonished at how a dog will pursue freedom so much. Freedom is a featured part of our human experience as well. This may be most resonant in your mind in recent days as uh, you recall the refrain from a popular movie entitled Braveheart. The featured character in this movie is a man called Wallace, and he is seeking to lead his people to freedom and to fight for the freedom that he believes they deserve. And there in the final scene, after he has been captured and he literally is giving his life for his cause, he's given the opportunity to ask, to beg for mercy. The persecutor says, if you will just simply speak the word, we will make this quick and it will end. And instead, with his last breath, with every ounce of his being as he died, he mustered all the strength within himself, and he yelled out, Freedom! You remember the scene, don't you? Vice President Cheney, speaking on October the 5th of 2004, said this, and I quote, The drive among humans for freedom is unbelievable. He was referencing observations that he made in the 1970s in El Salvador as people were seeking to vote democracy into place in that country. He said that some 75,000 people were killed in those lines as they sought to vote for their freedom. The amazing thing was that as they stood in those lines and were shot, after the smoke cleared, after bodies were removed while the bloodstains were still there next to those places. People came and got back in the lines again, risking their very lives for freedom. Aren't you thankful today that as we voted last week, that was not a threat to you? Someone has paid for that privilege that you experience in this nation today. Freedom is not only a part of life in general and a part of the human experience. It's a key part of our American heritage as well. You might say it's one of our core values. Writing a song in the midst of the American Revolution, Francis Scott Key wrote a song that became known as our national anthem. And at the climax of this song, he highlighted these words, the land of of the free and the home of the brave. And in fact, our bravery now has been coupled by way of reputation of freedom and our willingness to fight for it on all terms. Not only for our own freedom, but even for the freedom of others. This reputation continues in the Civil War. The Civil War was the one time in our history that the United States did not act like United States. In fact, they were torn over freedom. Father pitted against son 
brother against brother in the battle as we sought to settle this matter of how important the freedom of others was amongst us. Freedom is a dear quality to us. 1941, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, speaking at the end of the war, said to Congress, there are four freedoms for which we stand, a freedom of speech, freedom of worship, and we're experiencing that freedom here this morning, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. Freedom from something and freedom to something. There's an important emphasis also in our Christian faith on freedom. Though this freedom of the Christian faith operates in similar fashion to our national freedom, its power and benefits far exceed our frail and fragile human freedom. Paul addresses Christian freedom in Galatians chapter 4 and 5, and he gives a wonderful depiction of it, highlighted as one of the peaks of his teaching, Galatians 5 verse 1. We just sang it a little while ago in one of those verses. It says this, It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Jesus speaks about freedom at a critical juncture, and his interaction with the Jews, as recorded in John chapter 8. Now, as we approach the context of John chapter 8, we're going to look at verses 31 through 38 in just a moment. But I want you to, to look at, at this verse with the, the, the backdrop in mind of bracketing. Now let me explain what I mean by that. Bracketing is something that's pretty familiar to our military personnel. It's uh, something they use in both defensive and offensive situations. In a defensive situation, they will go in and set up what we refer to as sectors of fire. Every individual will do that as they set up a defensive line or a perimeter in order to secure safety. On one side of that sector of fire, they will literally drive a stick in the ground, and it marks the boundary of where they will aim and shoot. And on the other side of that sector of fire, they will drive another stick in the ground to mark the other end of their sector of fire. And the reason they drive sticks in the ground is so that even in the chaos, even in the darkness, they know the boundaries of their position and their responsibility. And what happens is each person in the line or each person in the circle of perimeter takes responsibility for their sector fire in such a way that they overlap at 45 degree angles so it's very hard to penetrate that defensive position. But you must commit, even in the chaos, firing between your sectors of fire. Because if you don't, you can wind up shooting some of your own people or creating a hole in which the enemy can come through and take advantage of your position. The other way that it's used offensively more is among the military artillery units. They use this term for bracketing in order to get on a target soon. Very quickly, what they will do is they will shoot around that lands on this side of their identified target. And then they will overcompensate, literally, they will go an extended measure to get on the other side of their target and shoot another round where it lands and it fixes a mark. And as they do that, then with math, in precision and quickness that you can, speed you cannot imagine, they will bracket those two marks and then they will set the center and they will fire a third round that will come usually very close to their target. Maybe a minor adjustment, and then they fire for effect. And they unleash all of the ammunition that they can on that spot in order to deal with that enemy target. I wish that we in the church could learn how to operate in our Christian freedom with similar things in mind. We could set up a quick defense, and we could set up a quick offense in such a way that we can represent our freedom to the world. As you think through this with me and as we process this idea of bracketing, I think there are some literary brackets in John chapter 8 that show us something about what Jesus is saying here. In the beginning of John chapter 8, what we find is the story of the woman who was caught in adultery. These people drag her into the room, and they ask Jesus a question seeking to trap him. They want to trap him. And at the end of this exchange, Jesus says to the woman, 
Woman, where are your accusers? Is there no one left to condemn you? She says, no, Lord. Jesus then says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. On the other end of this passage, in the beginning of John chapter 9, verses 1 through 7, we find another interesting side of this deliberation with the Pharisees and Jews. Jesus, as he's leaving the temple, as he's making his way out, because they have identified him now as a heretic, they think he's demon-possessed, maybe even suicidal, it says. They want to kill him, and Jesus decides it's time for me to leave, and he moves out through the crowd, and as he's going, literally running for his life in some aspect, he stops and heals a blind man. I think this becomes an icon, a representation of what he was trying to say and get them to do there in the temple as he was teaching them. And he says to this man, not go and sin no more, but he says, go and wash. Obey. And there I think we see another key bracket that leads us into a focus of what Jesus is talking about here to these Jews. Go and sin no more. Go and wash. As we look further at these brackets, we find in chapter 8, verse 29, Jesus speaks of doing the deeds of the Heavenly Father, being obedient. And I think that serves as a wonderful bracket. The other bracket in this pathway would be his challenge in verse 41 of chapter 8 to the Jews there. Supposedly Jews who had believed in him, he says, you're not doing the things of the Heavenly Father. Instead, you choose to do the things of your Father. And it's within the context of this bracketing momentum that we walk up to the text in John chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. Listen as I read today from the New American Standard, and you follow along in your copy of God's Word that you have before you there. As we hear these words, may we begin to appreciate the brackets for Christian freedom as we find them. In verse 31 it reads, So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed on him, If you continue in my word, when you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. The truth will make you free. This word for continue here, it may be translated in your Bibles as abide or remain. A word that I found that seemed to give it some additional meaning for me is the word sojourn. Sojourn. It's the concept of walking in God's Word. Two dimensions I'd like to emphasize for you this morning in relation to that concept of continuing in God's Word. The first bracket of experiencing Christian freedom, continuing in God's Word. First of all, I think that means along the lines of this idea of sojourn is that we take it with us everywhere we go. Everywhere. Recently, I took a group to Greece for the Olympics. Many of you know of that. And as I traveled there, I took with me my American freedom, represented in a passport. And it even gave me the authority to come back home when I got ready to do so. We should travel in the same way to other places with the Word of God being such a part of us that it goes, it dwells in us, and we might say as a commercial, we can't leave home without it. In a couple of weeks, Kathy and I are going to travel to Israel with a group from the seminary here. I'm going with the Word of God, hopefully richly dwelling in me and me continuing to walk in it to the degree that that makes that a wonderful spiritual experience. Here today, did you come continuing in God's Word? That is the expectation of Jesus if you want to experience Christian freedom in your life. The other dimension of this word for sojourn or continue has to do with the idea of it being a lasting quality. It's not something that you do just for a little while until you're tired of it, but it's a lifetime commitment. I've seen this manifested in the record 
that we have of those who guard the tomb of the unknown soldier. Roger Menifee recently sent me an email that had a characteristic of these people who so diligently serve. It's a rotating basis by various members of our branches of service who devote themselves to guard the tomb of the unknown soldier. In 1923, the time when Isabel was approaching Washington, D.C., a hurricane, these men, like the U.S. Senate and the House, were given the opportunity to take a couple of days off to relinquish their duties because of the storm approaching. The comment, the return to the opportunity was, no way, sir. This is our responsibility and our duty. And they did. They stood the watch faithfully, even in the midst of a storm. I'm impressed to report to you today that since 1930, that tomb has been guarded by our service members 24 hours a day, seven days a week, continuously. If men and women from our branches of service can do that for our human freedom, how much more should we not devote ourselves to doing that as Christians when we have a freedom that is so much grander and greater from eternity? You must continue in God's Word. Here's the level of those soldiers' commitments. When they accept that assignment, what it means is even beyond their two-year tour of duty, that they must agree never to drink another drop of alcohol. Never say a curse word in public again and do nothing that would be dishonorable to the uniform that they wear or to the tomb. A lifelong commitment. They're given a wreath pin that marks that honor, and at any point they step across that line, they must relinquish their pin and give it up. A lifetime commitment. I think it's an abomination to God that we as believers sometimes forget how to continue in God's Word and make similar kind of commitments for the freedom that we receive in exchange. It is this abiding freedom in God's Word that will help you turn from abiding in sin. It is the first bracket in experiencing Christian freedom. You must set this bracket in your life if you want to be set free. Psalms 119 verse 11 says this, I will hide thy word in thy heart, in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. When you stop sojourning in God's word, you can expect sin to meet you on the horizon soon. Take that with you today. If you stop sojourning in God's word, you can expect sin to meet you on the horizon. In John chapter 8, verse 33, we read these words. Listen. They answered him, the Jews, supposedly those who had believed in Jesus, probably echoing something they had learned from the Pharisees earlier in this dialogue. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Do you hear what they said? Never yet been enslaved. These folks need a history lesson, don't they? Apparently they've forgotten those 400 years in Egypt when they were under the persecution of the Pharaohs. What about Babylon? Do they remember that? And then there are other multiple sieges that they've been subjected to, and yet it seems like they're trying to fake it to me. It seems like they're trying to deny their past and who they have become. They want to claim Abraham's birthright, as they mention it here, but they don't want to accept Abraham's birth responsibility. And those two must go together. Birthright and birth responsibility. Even worse is this awareness about what they are doing. They've faked it so long that they've created a new perception of reality. And they can't even hear what Jesus is saying to them. They've faked it so well for so long that they've accepted this false reality. Now is the truth. I wonder today, in this great institution, in this place where we stand at the fountainhead of Southern Baptist life, if we may fall prey to the same mistake. 
being those who are most religious in our outward appearances, but having created a reality that is no longer God's reality. And we've learned to fake it so well that we don't even notice it when it's happened. I pray you will take inventory today of your life and not find yourself guilty of making the same mistake. When we come to chapel, can you sense God's Spirit moving? And if it isn't, are you on your face asking why? Let me give you a contemporary illustration of this. In 1692, Harvard College adopted a motto, Veritas Christos et Ecclesiae. If you want to hear that pronounced, properly without a southern accent you might want to see dr lord harsh after the service that's the best i can do it's latin and it means truth for christ and the church the crest on which they imprinted this motto had three books one facing down to show the limits of human knowledge and in recent days what they have done is they have reduced the motto to say truth just truth They've gotten rid of their heritage. Just truth. And they've turned over the other book. The first book was the at first the book was turned down to show the limits of human knowledge, and they've turned it over to symbolize the unendless capacity of human knowledge. I got news for those folks. They're faking it. They need to know that this is the only book that is going to lead them to that kind of truth and awareness as we seek God. Let me ask you again, what has changed in your life recently that is taking you away from God's truth and God's reality? In John chapter 8, verses 34 through 38, let's move there quickly. It says, Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, really, really, guys, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. That literally may be translated, my word makes no progress in you. It is the opposite of being continuously sojourning with you. It has no place in you. I speak the things which I have seen with my father, Therefore, you also do the things which you have heard from your Father. Jesus revisits this first bracket and says, those who commit sin, those who step outside of that boundary will become a slave to sin and they will die in their sin, he says in verse 24 previously. You'll become a slave in bondage to this. And then he follows along by setting clearly and distinctly the second bracket by his example and his confession. I do what the Father has showed me to do, and I obey Him. That is the other bracket of Christian freedom. You must obey God. It is freedom from sin. It is freedom to turn away from death and all that is a part of that and set that focus. But it is a free and fromness that brings you to obeying God as He leads you to walk in Christian life. Freedom to turn from sin. Freedom to obey God in all that you do. Now, let me meddle a bit if I may here. Freedom to say no. Freedom to say yes. And these are the brackets by which you live your life and walk Christian freedom. Freedom to say no when you're tempted to cheat on a test. Freedom to say no when maybe you're pulled away from your studies, the thing that God has called you to do for other less important priorities. Or just a goof off with your friends. Freedom to look the other way. To say no when maybe there's some kind of fleshly appeal that comes in your life. You say, no, get thee behind me, Satan. I'm going to turn away from that. The freedom to say no when people talk about you and say all kind of vile things about you and seek to hurt you with their mouth. Rather, you reacting, you learn to respond freely with Christian grace and mercy. And it's the freedom to say yes 
Yes, God, I will do the unorthodox. Even though people will say things about me. I will do the absurd. If you have called me to do it, I will follow your spirit. Wherever you lead me, I will go. It's in this kind of bracket that I have responded to a call from the military to go and serve in the heat of the battle after the first of the year. I'll be deployed January 15th. And it's only this freedom that involves continuing in God's Word and obeying His direction that I could even think about going into harm's way. But God has called me to a ministry there, and I want to serve Him in that place. At the door at the MEP Center where people are processed for military duty here in New Orleans, there is a mat. Dr. Shaddix, I don't know if you'll remember us walking across this a few months ago as we took your son down there to sign a contract for the Navy. But as I walked through the door, I noticed this mat, and it said, Freedom Front Door. I stopped. It stunned me at first. The truth and the falseness of that statement at the same time. If you know anything about the military, when you cross that threshold, there is no more freedom. You give up all your freedom. And somebody has the opportunity to tell you what to do almost every day of your life in the military. But you know what? That actually can be freedom. You don't have to worry about it anymore. In Christian faith and freedom, guess what? I don't have to worry about it anymore. I've got somebody to tell me what to do every moment of every day. There's great truth in that. The falsity I find is, is that we somehow have couched in our American society that those human efforts are going to create true and lasting freedom. And our military cannot provide those things. The only thing that can produce those kind of things is the freedom of the cross. And that needs to become our icon for freedom in these days. As you move through these brackets and set your course of your life upon them, freedom from sin Freedom to obey, it will get easier each time you do it. Easier and easier. And before long, you don't even have to look up. Like Job, you're following God faithfully. Let me say to you the reverse is true of sin as well. It's just as easy to get caught up in a pattern of sin. And then one day you wake up faking your freedom. Faking your freedom. We live in the greatest nation in the world with the opportunity to express the best freedom the world has ever known. Don't waste your opportunity by making the mistakes that these Jews did, by faking your freedom, by living a fictitious life. Instead, the desire would be for you to find what Jesus spoke about here in verse 36. So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Free indeed. Free. Indeed. I want to give you just a couple of minutes to think about that opportunity today. We have one who's going to come and sing a song that accentuates what we've talked about. And during this song, I want you to ask God today, Lord, am I operating within the brackets of your expectations of Christian life? Help me to walk out of these doors today with a commitment to live free indeed. And may the world see and be drawn to that example. Bow your heads in prayer. After the song is sung, Dr. Shaddix will come and close our service.
said to you in his um, message a little bit ago, something that many of you know, others of you may have heard it for the first time, and that is that he has recently received orders uh, to be deployed in January. And, uh, Dr. Kelly called me last week and reminded me that he was going to be out of town this week because of the state conventions, but he said, I, I want the seminary family to pray for you. Now, before I ask them to come up here and, and ask you to pray over them and for them, I want you to know that this family would want you to understand that the situation they're about to encounter is not any more important than that of some of our other students who have been deployed, these other military men and women that are sitting here. We all understand that. Uh, but they represent for us a host of others. And it was a privilege for us to be able to pray for them and as we pray for them, pray for others as well. They're part of our family. They're very precious to me. Dr. Lee is a colleague. He is a friend. And Kathy is a friend. Their children are my children's friend, and I have the privilege of being their pastor and a co-worker and staff member of Kathy. And uh, we're going to have a chance, some of us as a church family, but all of us as a seminary family, to be God's expression of grace for these boys and this wife and mother in his absence. 
but also to be prayer warriors on his behalf, as well as all of the rest of those. We'll be leaving in January. Uh, where is not uh, important other than for you to know he's going to be going into the heat of the battle. And so we want to pray for that. I'd like for us to conclude our service by asking uh, Wendell and Kathy and uh, Cody and Hunter just to come. And then it, I, I'd just like to invite you, many of you if will, just to come into this altar area. I know that um, all of you can't get here. I want to lead us in a prayer for them, and then we'll be dismissed. So you come, and let's uh, serve in the Lord. Father, you uh, have allowed us to celebrate the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ today. Thank you for loving us that much. And thank you that uh, when you, Lord Jesus, um, departed from here bodily, you didn't leave us alone. But you gave us the Holy Spirit, our friend and our comforter. Lord, I want to thank you today that you uh, knew that we would need one another. And so you've given us friends and co-laborers and partners in ministry, brothers and sisters in Christ. We come to you on behalf of these that are very special to us today. And through them, a host of others who are rearranging their lives for the sake of freedom. Lord, I want to thank you that you are calling some to rearrange their lives who are, who are Christians, who are believers, and you're sending them into a place where there is no greater need than for the word of hope to be spoken. God, I pray for Endel today. Thank you for investing him in our lives. Thank you for investing him in our country. God, I pray you'd fill him with your spirit and continue to give him courage and boldness based in his relationship with Jesus Christ. Lord, selfishly, we pray that you would protect him as he goes, as he serves, and as he returns. From a kingdom perspective as well as a national perspective, we trust his life with you. Give him boldness to speak the word of the gospel to men and women who need to hear it. Lord, we trust you with him today. Lord, thank you for Kathy. God, thank you for a model for us as a wife and a mother. Lord, we accept the responsibility you give us to care for her. And Lord, we pray that you would be a husband to her in Endel's absence. Fill her with your spirit and comfort her moment by moment, day by day. Lord, for Cody and for Hunter, thank you for two precious boys, Lord, who, who love life and who love their dad and their mom. God, give these young men grace. You be a father to them in Endel's absence. Mature them and grow them. And I pray you'd use it as a season to draw them closer to Jesus than they've ever been before. Father, for us as a seminary community, fellow church members and co-laborers in the gospel, we pray you'd give us grace to love on this family to pray for them often, to encourage them. And Lord, we look forward to how you are going to glorify yourself in their lives and in ours as well. In Jesus' name, amen.